Hi everyone, welcome to the ninth session of the Circular African Cities Community of Practice Meetings. Before we officially get started, I'm just going to give it a moment to allow um, participants to arrive. And while we do that, can I also just note that as usual, our session is hosted in both English and French. So please do listen um, to the session in your preferred language. If you're English speaking, please do listen in English so that you can hear our French participants when they speak. And to all our French participants, we do have French interpretation. So please do um, select the icon at the bottom of your screen to choose your preferred language to listen in. I think we can get started now. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, the session today is meant to be interactive as well as very much conversational. So please do feel free to engage in the chat with regards to any questions or comments or insights that you would like to share. Um, and uh, just to get the chats rolling, perhaps I could just ask everyone to just in the chat, just let us know who you are and where you're joining us from, just so we can um, know who is joining us, uh, what field you're working in, and perhaps if you don't mind sharing also what interests you about today's topic. So to get started, our session today is... Um, well, largely focused around a huge upcoming event towards the end of the year, which is exactly 30 days from right now, which is the upcoming uh, COP27. And our session today aims to explore the linkages between circular economy and climate action, specifically looking at uh, that session, uh, or rather that um, program that's upcoming. And so we will also try to explore what our expectations of COP27 are. Our session today is co-convened by Ikle Africa as well as ASIN, and we do have two speakers with us today who will be sharing some insights on this topic. So we do have Elisa Loatenen, who is an expert in circular economy at the African Development Bank, and then we also have Magash Naidu, who heads the circular development team at the Ikle World Secretariat. So for today's session, we will begin with um, an overview of what COP is and specifically COP27. And um, for that, I'll call on Chris, who is also our co-convener from ASEN, to just give a little intro into what COP is and um, just to give us a sense of what the topic will be. And then from there, we will jump to our two panelists to hear their perspectives on today's topic. And uh, from there, we will open the discussion for everyone to engage. So while they're speaking, please do share your insights or questions for, um, for the group in the chat. And um, thereafter, we will jump into some breakout rooms where we will engage further on today's topic. So without wasting any time, I'd like to then call on Chris to just give us an overview of what COP is and what COP27 will be about. Thank you, Jokuru. I'm not going to go into too many details. I'm assuming that a lot of people here will understand uh, what the Conference of the Parties is all about. Uh, essentially, we're looking at uh, sort of global alignment in terms of trying to understand our impact on the planet and looking at sustainable uh, opportunities for uh, for future development um, that is going to create a just transition and, and hopefully allow Africa to emerge um, as, as, as a leader in, uh, in sustainability and circular economy. Um, from our hope uh, in terms of the COP27, uh, obviously the last one was held in Glasgow, COP26, and there were a number of key outcomes coming from that uh, that hold a number of opportunities for alignment to circular economy. Uh, specifically around those were the opportunities around uh, environmental, social and corporate governance reporting uh, that affects not only big corporates, but governments, banks and, and other uh, institutions, um, but also the alignment in terms of the international financial regulatory standards and the International uh, Sustainability Standards Board, uh, which, is, which has been promulgated out of that. 
And the idea from that really is to look at the alignment, looking at, at uh, transparent ESG reporting, looking at scope one, two, and three uh, assessments, uh, trying to achieve our uh, nationally determined contributions and ensure our low carbon transition. Uh, there's a hope, obviously, that we can look at some of the key outcomes uh, with this COP being in Africa to look at maybe an Africa-centric approach, uh, particularly around our uh, our drive towards circular economy across the many different sectors. Um, we are hoping that uh, some of the people that uh, are in this room will be there and are also looking forward to finding out what the outcomes are of the COP27. Um, I'm going to leave it more in the hands of uh, Elisa Liotonen and Magash Naidu to uh, unpack some of their expectations um, and linkages with uh, COP27, uh, circular economy and the opportunity around climate finance and what that brings to Africa. So welcome everybody. I look forward to, to a healthy discussion. Yes, thank you so much, Chris, um, for that overview. I think it's quite helpful and also just um, pointing the connections to a previous session we held um, with the community of practice on finance. So for anyone who was in that session, this is quite an interesting continuation of some of the discussion points that emerged from there. But um, I would like to then call on our first speaker, who will be Elisa, and then we'll follow up with um, Magash. So over to you, Elisa, to just introduce yourself and then and share your insights on COP27 and expectations. Yes, thank you a lot. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, so indeed, my name is Elisa Luotonen and um, I work at the African Development Bank uh, in, the, in the circular economy team, uh, which is under the Depri Department for uh, Climate Change and Green Growth. So um, I will I will just uh, say a couple of words about uh, circular economy in AFDB's uh, green growth strategy, and then uh, AFDB's role uh, um, in the COP process, and then a little bit about about our plans uh, on COP twenty seven related to circular economy. Um, but so uh, circular economy is is definitely a part of the the green growth strategy of. Um, of the AFDB and the, the climate, climate action. And uh, both from mitigation side and from the adaptation side. So, um, so what uh, from the mitigation side, what circular economy can bring is to, to bring uh, uh, emission reductions from, from a um, broader, uh, broader scope or, or involve also other, other sectors than just energy and the traditional um, emission mitigation uh, sectors. So for example, regenerative agriculture or, or also um, um, reductions coming from uh, more efficient resource use and more, uh, res uh, more efficient material use. And this is something that, for example, our NDCs hub, which is also uh, hosted uh, in, our, uh, in our department uh, is doing helping countries to, uh, to include um, include also circular economy and this kind of new ways to, to mitigate emissions uh, into their NDCs. Um, and from the adaptation side, especially, that's even, you could say, more important part of the, uh, uh, more important for the, for the African countries often, uh, the adaptation to changing climate. So their circular economy can, uh, can bring many benefits. Uh, first of all, diversification of, of economies uh, creating um, new jobs and uh, new kind of lucrative sec sectors that are uh, simultaneously uh, effective in, in resource use and, um, uh, and so on. Also another adaptation um, aspect is that uh, sometimes, for example, better waste management can, uh, can uh, mitigate the adverse impact of, of, of climate change, such as uh, better management of waste, uh, also um, um, partly can uh, reduce the risks that floods, for example, bring. So this kind of, the, the, the role of waste management uh, in all that equation. Um, but so, yeah, I mentioned already that we are, we are working through the NDCs hub, uh, in addition to, to many of our climate-related uh, uh, 
facilities. Um, I wanted to highlight one facility, which is the newest one, which I am coordinating, which is the Africa Circular Economy Facility. It has been launched uh, in the spring and we're currently in the operationalization of, of this facility. So um, uh, with the funds, we really aim to create an enabling environment for, for circular economy uh, and a wider adoption of the, of the practices. So both supporting uh, governments and the public sector uh, to, to create an, a, a policy environment that enables uh, enables circular economy, but also working with the private sector uh, to, to support scaling of, of viable solutions. And also, uh, we, are, we are also aiming at, um, um, at seeing how we could also scale private financing uh, um, for, these, for these topics. Um, related to, uh, to COP, COP processes or COP in general. So um, African Development Bank has two different, uh, you could say paths being involved in the COP, COP processes. So one is the negotiation path. And there is a whole team at, uh, at the FDB in our department who is, who is supporting countries in the negotiations. Uh, I am less familiar with that side of the work, but I can definitely connect you with people who are uh, are responsible for that work, and then there is the other path, which is the the um, we could say the uh, Africa Pavilion and the side events path. Africa Pavilion's role is to support the countries in their negotiation and also uh, provide a venue to showcase showcase uh, what African countries are doing uh, uh, related to to um, the particular COP topic that is uh, at hand. So indeed the COP, um, uh, the Africa Pavilion has been there for many years at the COP, um, at the climate COPs. It's also been there for the, the um, uh, COP 15, for example, last, uh, last spring. And now we are also having, as in previous years, the, uh, the Africa Pavilion at the COP 27. So um, African Development Bank is one of the core partners of the, um, of the Africa Pavilion alongside uh, African Union, uh, UNECA, and uh, also NEPAD, for example, is part of that. And uh, there, will be, um, there will be dozens of, of side events during, uh, during this, uh, this COP27, this upcoming COP27. And there has been a lot of demand for the for the side event slots. Um, there, uh, there were, I think there was only one that was geared uh, around circular economy for the African pavilion. So we are quite confident that we could be getting uh, a side event uh, there uh, geared to circular economy. And uh, also uh, where the concept of this session would be highlighting how African countries can include circular economy in their national development strategies. Uh, also how it can co contribute to job creation and improved conditions for, for vulnerable people. Um, it also would aim at uh, raising the profile of, of waste management interventions as climate mitigation and adaptation, because uh, it's, it's, waste management is often not prioritized as one of the one of the mitigation and adaptation methods. Um, and the third, third topic or goal of this, uh, this side session would be uh, to highlight the, the importance of access to finance and, and closing, closing the gap there. Um, so this side event is not yet confirmed, but uh, we are very confident that it will happen. The date has not been yet confirmed, uh, but. I could say we are very confident that it will happen uh, uh, happen there, and uh, uh, it would be in a format of a panel panel discussion where we would have representatives of uh, African governments uh, and also uh, representatives of um, um, of international organizations uh, telling uh, uh, about or uh, uh, telling about projects implemented either in. Uh, in the field of 
in, uh, involving or incorporating circular economy uh, in the national development strategies, and also highlighting some of the uh, some of the waste management projects that have had a climate impact. So that would be uh, that would be in a nutshell uh, what AFDB uh, is is how, how circular economy relates to uh, AFDB's green growth strategy and also what kind of a role um, the bank has in the in the COPs in general and and uh, especially on the uh, on the upcoming COP. Uh, Thank you a lot and back to you, Jakudu. Thank you so much, Elisa. I think, yeah, definitely the role that the bank is playing is quite an important one and it's um, great to hear about the connections. Perhaps um, I won't go into questions right now because I'd like to head over to Magash first to um, share his input before we open discussions. But um, just one point to also note is I see Piotr has also put a link to a session that is taking place um, hosted by the AFDB coming up closer to the end of this month and um, perhaps when we get into discussions if you could also speak about some of the outcomes that are coming from that or the um, expectations for that session but over to you Magash. Thanks Jukuru. Hi everyone, Magash Naidu from the World Secretariat of ICLI, uh, part of the circular development team. So um, I think there's 30 days and 12 hours, 41 minutes to go before COP, right? So it's almost here. Everyone has their visas um, and flights sorted out. And don't forget to offset the emissions from your flights. So Chris and Elisa talked about NDCs. Um, and I just want to add that of the updated NDCs um, from last year, I think only about 75 of them mentioned circular economy. Sorry, is there a technical problem yes. to put in? No, um, could I also just ask our participants to please um, do keep your mics on mute. Commander, Commander, Commander David, if we could please mute your, your mic. Yes. Perfect, okay. Um, sorry, I was saying, of the updated NDCs um, towards the end of last year, only 75 mentioned the term circular economy. Uh, and given the fact that there's 193 countries that uh, submit NDCs, I think this is uh, a little bit concerning. It did give me a little bit of stress when I was preparing for this uh, session when it hit me in terms of the magnitude of what we still have to do. Just to contextualize where we are at, the Rio summit was in 92. This is 30 years ago. And the climate agenda, as we know it, has taken all this time to progress to this point. Yes, we've had some um, milestone COPs and, and um, agreements, protocols of Kyoto Protocol, Paris Agreement. Um, Durban COP was instrumental in getting us to the um, Paris Agreement and also my home city, Durban. But it's important to note we've had a lot of progress and at the same time we've regressed in instances if you take what's happening now um, the complications that is being uh, experienced from events such as the implications from the war in ukraine and the need for energy sources this not only adds a further level of complexity but puts some of the perhaps not so low hanging fruits in terms of climate interventions uh, further out of reach. And this is part of where circularity lies, right? It's not, an, it's not a low hanging fruit in terms of interventions because it's pretty complex as everybody in this call knows. Um, and then you further rope in the need for developing countries to develop. Um, utilizing sort of feasible energy sources that um, can also stimulate jobs. Really complex and it's taken us 30 years to get to this point. What, what I'm trying to get at is that in terms of the circular agenda, it's relatively new. And if we don't start to integrate the circular agenda 
with the climate agenda. We're going to take decades to get to this point now where the climate agenda is. So we know that um, circularity is pretty much linked with the waste agenda. And it's an easy entry point, particularly because this is a key mandate of subnational governments or local governments. Um, and also the practicalities, a lot of these local governments face pressing waste management challenges. On the flip side um, of this, the uptake, is, as we know, partly because policymakers have not fully understood the um, value add that circular development, circular economy is, um, can bring to the party. And it's definitely not as well positioned as it can be, particularly being, it can be positioned better um, to address the climate emergency and the Paris Agreement, I think. And Lisa was alluding to uh, some of these points earlier. So as an example, if we look at the research from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, something like 55% of emissions can be addressed by renewable energy and um, energy efficiency interventions or traditional mitigation interventions. But the remaining 45%, so kind of the last mile, if you would like, um, is attributed to consumption, right? Um, and this is then where circularity has to come into play to address this remaining 45% of emissions to take us to this future of being green at zero. But it's not being taken seriously. Um, and we have then a lot more advocacy to do in the space. Um, so, again, coming to the point that if we had to carve out our own space for circular development in terms of um, a climate agenda, a separate agenda, it would take many decades. The only feasible option is to better integrate circularity as a tool into the climate dialogue. Um, personally, and um, I know we've been recorded, but personally, I am not seeing any meaningful or um, breakthrough sort of hole in the wall um, interventions or circularity from the main negotiations of COP. There are some fantastic initiatives though that are being launched, which we'll come to in a little bit. Just in terms of ICLEI's advocacy role within COP on circularity, ICLEI has been part of the Marrakesh Partnership for Global, Global Climate Action for um, some time now particularly within the human settlements pathway, and we then lead the waste and consumption working group. And the Marrakesh Partnership, as some of you may know, uh, is a means or a platform for local government business and many other stakeholders to support the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Um, so maybe it does not easily allow input into negotiation processes, but we do get a lot of support from the high level champions. Specifically within COP for the Marrakesh Partnership, there is an action event taking place on the 17th. Um, and this is, I believe, Solutions Day. And this event will essentially highlight the signals of change from around the world that are aggressively working towards net zero, resilient, equitable, affordable, and safe human settlements. Um, focusing on how implementing the circular economy in dense urban areas can bring them out tremendous economic, social, and environmental benefits. So often um, we are posed with the question as to why is circular development? It's too expensive, it's too complex. But we have the opinion that circular development holds a huge untapped potential to bridge many divides, particularly then the developmental um, divide from global south, so to speak. In addition to the Marrakesh Partnership, um, there is also an initiative called the Sustainable Urban Resilience for Next Generation or SURGE initiative that will be launched. And this is led by the Arab Republic of Egypt in collaboration with the UN Habitat and facilitated by ICLEI. This will be launched on the 17th as well on Solutions Day. Um, and without giving away too much, I can give you a, a quick sneak peek. This surge initiative is essentially a, um, a framework of sorts 
to better coordinate existing work um, around some uh, thematic areas, which I'll go through now, and accelerate this work uh, to obviously achieve sustainable and resilient uh, urban spaces. The five working groups within the SURGE initiative are the Buildings and Housing so Working Group, Urban Energy, um, Urban Waste and Consumption, Urban Mobility, and Urban Water. So I think somebody's come off mute. Um, specifically for the waste and consumption um, focus or objectives, we're seeking to enhance municipal solid waste management systems that enable zero waste cities and circular economies while ensuring an accelerated transition towards 1.5 degree lifestyles that support social equity, food security, resilience, sustainable economic development, culture of sustainability and job creation supported by sustainable procurement policies and strong education, training, public awareness and participation. So, this is kind of um, the highlights um, and we could go on for quite a bit, uh, but we thought it important to just highlight those two major interventions that the key is involved in in terms of COP. Just taking a step back though, and focusing on what we need, looking at circularity and interfacing with COP27. This COP27 is being um, talked about or positioned largely as an action orientated COP. Um, based on this, there's a few things that are really important. Obviously, multi-level action needs to be strengthened. And again, I think everybody knows of the nuances of this, so we won't go into too much of detail. But importantly, um, I think the energy transition needs to better follow circular principles in order not to cause waste management challenges. Um, later on, we've seen a huge um, deployment of various renewable technologies, be it wind turbines, uh, PV, and so on and so forth. But we're not actively talking about end of life renewable technologies. So this is something ICLI is currently working on and will be um, kind of launching um, soon. <laughs> so just coming back to the COP, focusing on implementation, I think circular development offers um, the answer in terms of the how. Uh, it provides an approach that is actionable across many sectors. But to get to that point, we still need to overcome some critical barriers of understanding of policymakers of what circular development actually is. And this then is why advocacy and everybody in this room has such an important role to play to go out and educate everybody. It's the same learning curve we saw with energy transition, even with simple technologies like solar. Um, I remember a time when we were rolling out tens of thousands of solar water heaters um, for free, and there was an element where people had to go and purchase them. But we were advocating for people to go and install solar water heaters, and we weren't getting the uptake that we wanted to. Then we did a bit of market research and realized that people actually didn't understand what solar water heaters are. So I think in this instance as well, a similar learning curve needs to be followed and concerted effort is needed on um, education and awareness. Um, another important point that's missing is that there's no integration. Each stakeholder, be it um, an NGO like ICLI, other city um, platforms and, and, and organizations, banks, um, businesses, national government, I think the intentions are correct, but sometimes the initiatives are developed in an, in an uncoordinated fashion. So there needs to be a lot of integration with each stakeholder obviously playing their unique role, but contributing to the systemic um, enhancement of circularity. The last point, and linked to what I was talking about, and this is where ICLI has been developing a theory of change, which we're positioning as a global circular development, a strategic global circular development program. This theory of change is based on three fundamental elements, and this is analyze, act, and accelerate. And it, is, it essentially provides a series of steps for cities to follow 
um, to allow them to transition to a circular future, but also makes critical allowances for key stakeholders to sort of pull the ball in the in, in the same direction. Often we come across um, initiatives, um, knowledge products that are somewhat contradictory, but if we all coordinate, I think there's um, a lot of uh, catalyzing and time that can be saved for getting us to where we need to be. So um, I believe this theory of change could be, uh, it's, an, it's a nice blueprint, I guess, the glue that will hold it together is how we implement it going forward. So maybe I stop there and you could do a hand back mm -hmm. over to you. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Makash. I think um, what you've done is also just um, give great perspective into where we are currently and what needs to happen. I like that you pointed out um, the importance of taking action as opposed to um, hoping that we will reach our targets. Um, by the time all these um, global goals and commitments that we've committed to um, arrive. And so just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions for our speakers, please do um, paste them in the chat or raise your hand so that you can ask them. But um, one that I might just ask to get the conversation started um, goes um, both to yourself, Magash, and to you, Elisa, is just trying to get a sense of, well, um, especially from what Magash has presented, the need for taking action and um, grounding the emerging discussion points into what is practically happening, say, across the African continent, let alone globally. So um, how can we then ensure that all these ideas that we're speaking about are actually translating into policy? We see a lot of work coming through, say, from policy as um, the work is being shown from what AFDB is doing. How do we then shift from creating policies into then actually taking action and seeing the voices of, or even the actions of different people around um, the continent being featured in these spaces when decision-making is taking place. Would you like me to go first? Um, you can go first. Perfect. So this is um, a, an important question. It might seem simple. And I think how we, actually roll this out is, is rather complex. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start by a simple principle um, that might seem obvious, but we don't practice it. And this is by communication. Often, sometimes in same organizations, we're not communicating. So this is much more tricky when you're communicating across continents, across, across countries, across stakeholders. This is the foundation of being able to coordinate and ensure that we can not just develop policy and policy can be developed by us sitting behind a laptop, right? But is this policy then going to be worthwhile? Um, no, if maybe by, by some fluke or some chance it might be valuable, um, but generally without insight from people, key stakeholders, there's not going to be any value. And this is again where communication comes into play. In addition to the communication aspect, there's a level of trust that needs to be built up. How do we have governments that take certain decisions that perhaps reduce the trust of their citizens, have, you know, have the same government then make policies um, and allow space for input. It's kind of a, a tricky space because trust is broken. So what I'm kind of alluding to is there needs to be a systemic thought and um, almost altruistic behavior in terms of key stakeholders to bring everything together. At the same time, just one point, it is tricky sometimes when working across stakeholders because of conflicting goals and objectives. Government often has to be very uh, neutral because it's a space that lots of stakeholders um, leverage off. When working, I guess, with business for profit entities, their focus is often on a different um, level. Now, in this instance, one would um, try to develop consensus, but I think consensus 
is a very uh, dangerous space to, 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 to play in. Because when you get to consensus, you're probably not getting to the best decision one could make at that particular point in time, be it a policy or translating a policy to a particular program. And this is where compromise is needed. So if government needs to make a particular decision, perhaps citizens benefit, but businesses um, get the short end of the stick, so to speak, there needs to be a level of compromise there. So just speaking about some principles at a very broad level, um, but maybe I, I leave it there for now. Thanks. Thank you, my gosh. Um, maybe we could then get Elisa's perspectives. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. And uh, indeed, as, as Magash is saying, uh, it's not easy to create uh, enabling environments for circular economy. Uh, circular economy being a concept that cross cuts industries, uh, also cross cuts uh, national borders. So uh, as, as Magash was saying, uh, communication is key or actually even collaboration. Um, we often, now, um, well, now we are starting with, with ASEF, uh, Africa Circular Economy Facility. And indeed you referred to the, to the webinar that we are holding uh, in less than a month's time um, to, to speak about the national circular economy road mapping as kind of the uh, first, first step into creating those enabling environments and the road mapping process, it needs to, you need to have information about the current situation. However, uh, as the topic is so broad, you cannot wait until you have perfect information before you start taking action. So in a way, like uh, you need to do, you need to do parallel implementation and kind of uh, baseline scoping and action planning. Can't can't wait that um, that that everything is is uh, the the setup will be perfect in a way. And uh, as we're talking about a very complex topic, uh, as as Margash was saying, you will never uh, create the perfect policy because the world is not like that. Uh, uh, there is always trade offs. For example, uh, like one being uh, every country being being uh, uh, being um, uh, different in their own way, but however, we would like to encourage also regional integration, harmonization. So you need to balance these kind of uh, these kind of elements as well. So uh, yeah, I don't I don't have a silver bullet to this and. Uh, we are not even after that uh, with ASEF. We are just uh, we have just taken uh, the approach that we will need to start somewhere and uh, and then work from from there. So uh, we also we encourage uh, all the countries to exactly um, do the same. Start the road mapping exercise in their own context. See how it links to the uh, to the uh, plans and strategies of. Of neighbors and other peers, so so um, in a way, uh, starting starting now and adjusting the plans as 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 you go would be my way forward. Or... Definitely, thank you. Um, maybe just to point out something that has been put in the chat is um, a question specifically at Magash, which is the initiative you mentioned. Um, uh, which is about urban environment has uh, something to do with another EGY initiative called 50 by 2050. And so um, to him, he has noted that there's a lot of convergence on the con on the content between the two initiatives. So I was wondering maybe um, whether my gosh, you do have any additions to that or reflections on that point. Thanks, Jukudu. Um, Piotr, I think this is... Um really good question. It's a question that has crossed our minds as well. So you're 100% correct. The 50 by 2050 waste initiative will also be launched on, on solution space for 17. Um, I'm not sure on timing, either before or after the surge initiative. But um, we have, uh, this initiative is also being led by the uh, Arab Republic of, of Egypt. 
we have had um, some discussions with Dr. Nagwa, um, who is, I guess, the focal point for the initiative. And we're currently developing um, proposals or ways, possibilities, and how these two internet, um, initiatives can interface um, and synergize. Um, fundamentally, though, obviously, they're pitched at slightly different um, levels um, and scopes. But um, I agree, they are they have, they appear to be a number of synergies and we're, we're, we're exploring this. Thanks. Thank you so much, my gosh. And then um, from there, I'd like to then take us back to some of the points that, uh, that Elisa had made around um, around the development of national roadmaps and perhaps to jump into well the importance of or the reason behind specifically choosing the roadmap as one of the tools to um to shift from just policy generation into starting to bring in the implementation aspect. Uh, just noting what Chris has noted in the chat, which is that a continental guideline is also required, but uniqueness of economies should allow for um, local strategy, such as country-based circular economy roadmaps and action plans. So um, maybe Elisa, you would like to speak a little bit about, um, or a little bit more about the importance of using roadmaps as one of the tools for implementing circular economy. Um, yeah, thanks. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, the, the background of, uh, of having, having a roadmap for strategy implementation or is of course not like, um, it's not unique to circular economy, but it's especially useful for implementation of a concept or, or a development strategy such as circular economy because as as I said it's or as we all know it's very very cross-cutting across sectors and often the the for example the the policy policy development falls into the uh, table of many different ministries and many different agencies also is it cross cuts like uh the national level policies and then the municipal and and uh, other more local local policy making uh, so that is why a roadmap in this context is is you could say even more more useful because it can bring uh, different stakeholders also from from private sector for example um, in this context it's even hard to identify the bottlenecks uh, for for a wider scale up or or implementation of circular solutions, uh, it can be hard to identify the bottlenecks from behind your 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 computer screen in your in your ministry. You really need to involve the private sector as well to understand uh, where where you would like to be going and how and what are the bottlenecks. So, indeed, this roadmap process, rather than even. Um, we often say that the process is even more important in this case, the, the process of involving, uh, involving uh, representatives of different ministries, different agencies, uh, private sector and different uh, sectors of the private sector, kind of a really broad participation in the creation of this roadmap. So that once, once it's the time for implementation, there is also a broad ownership of that roadmap and also the same language that, uh, that is spoken around the implementation. So, um, so even though the outcome is very important as well, but shouldn't forget the importance of that process. It's definitely not a, it's not a, a, a desktop exercise and it's definitely not something that, uh, you can hire an expert to do for you. No, it really needs to be in, in, in every country uh, or in every region or, or depends on the, on, the, on the level where you wanna do your road mapping exercise, but you need to do it through this, involve, this, this um, process that involves all the stakeholders. Otherwise, it's just going to be a, a bunch of paper that will be remaining in the drawer. So that would be maybe something that how I see the importance of that road mapping exercise. 
Yeah, no, thank you for that input. And again, for even reiterating the point that a lot of these processes aren't meant to be static, but the importance of actually taking action and learning from um, the insights that emerge from having uh, taken a step towards um, achieving the goal or towards implementing a circular economy initiative is quite important. And your point ties quite well with one that uh, Florence had put into the chat. Um, although it was French, we have tried to translate it. So I'm going to um, try and read it out to everyone in case uh, people might have missed it. And uh, Florence noted that to begin with, yes, but we are forgetting that circularity can also generate GHGs in large quantities and in Africa as well, if not at a national level. And so there's a lack of carbon measurement to validate circularity that respects the planet. So um, how do we then talk about things such as re regeneration and why and should we? And so just noting the importance of, again, something that Chris mentioned in his introduction was, again, the importance of measuring circular economy, of um, ratings that are emerging um, across the continent and what those mean for the actions that businesses can take, that um, circular economy um, departments in local governments can take. And so I think this can lead us quite well into our next portion of today's um, program, which is I'd like to break us up all into um, groups and uh, breakout rooms where we can discuss a couple of questions um, to further uh, deepen our discussion today. And so in the breakout rooms, we'd like you to discuss perhaps what role do you see circular economy playing in climate action? And I think a lot of this has um, emerged in the discussions that uh, both Elisa and Magash have uh, provided today, as well as what role do you think you can play in contributing to the circular economy transition for climate action within your different sectors, if perhaps you um, have not yet made the direct linkages to COP27. And then the second question is what impacts and expectations uh, do you have of global um, commitments for a circular economy transition? Are we seeing this taking place in um, in COP27 and in various um, global platforms. We heard from Agash the realities of where we stand currently and what has been achieved since um, the emergence of the COPs and the progress that has been made thus far. And then perhaps any additional key insights that you would like to add to the conversation that we have not covered at um, this moment. So Zakia has put into the chat um, the questions. Please do note them. Just a note for our French participants, if you are assigned to a room, please um, do not accept the invitation. Please remain in the main plenary and um, from there we will have a discussion in the main room. So just noting those questions, I will now open the breakout rooms for about 7 to 10 minutes for you to discuss the question. Please do appoint one person to feedback to the main room um, when we end. Um, thank you, everyone. I hope your breakout room discussions went quite well. Welcome back to the main plenary. We had quite an interesting discussion here with our French participants. So um, perhaps we'd just like to jump quickly into some of the insights that have come out from these discussions. And maybe we can start with our French um, colleagues to share what was discussed here in the main room. And just a reminder to everyone who's listening in English to please um, make sure that you are on the English um, interpretation channel so that you can hear the inputs. Over to you, Florence. Hey. Hey, Monsieur Yao. <laughs> Mr. Yao is going to, okay. Oh, okay. to do it, I think. Oh, no okay. problem. Well, thank you then for giving me the floor. For our group, we understood that the concept of circular economy itself is somewhat ambivalent because it's a recent concept for us, especially for French speaking countries. But at the same time, circular practices have always taken place and are part of our tradition. So it's all about owning uh, the concepts and making sure that we use the right 
terminology so that the concept of circular economy is better understood at all levels. And we also mentioned the fact that uh, the narrative uh, around circular economy is still at an embryo level, and therefore there is a need to put actions into place so it is better understood at the highest level. And we've also realized that circular economy practices can be observed mostly in informal sectors, even if the informal sector is marginalized and is not prioritized compared to structured sectors. And again, these more structured sectors are not fully involved in the discussions around circular economy. Therefore, as a conclusion, we need to adapt the terminology around circular economy to our continent. And we should also stop forgetting circular tradition and circular practices that can be observed in the informal sector. And we should also involve the private sector so they can fully grasp and take on the challenges of circular economy and include these practices into their practices. And finally, we should democratize uh, these concepts so everyone understands the concept of circularity, even all the way down to the assholes. This is the only way that economies, circular economy can contribute to the measures of um, climate change mitigation. Thank you. No, thank you so much, Mr. Eduard Yao, for sharing those perspectives, very um, relevant and well tied to some of the points that uh, Magash had pointed out, which is we need to start thinking about how we practicalize making um, or taking action for circular economy implementation. And from what you've said, not forgetting the very clear things that we um, do need to ensure are put in place, which is ensuring that everyone understands what circular economy is. And there's still a lot of work that needs to be be done in that space despite all the progress that we have made. Um, perhaps we could hear from the first group, if you were in group one, if you could please share some of um, the insights that came from your discussion. Are they similar to what we heard from our French participants or different? <clears throat> Thank you, Jokuju. So basically, uh, I will just uh, reflect on what we talked about. Um, the first thing we reflected on was the role of circular economy in climate action. And essentially, I think there was a contribution that given that um, the circular economy also seeks to reduce waste um, and so it will basically contribute into maintaining the geological structure that we have. And maybe you should take a, as an example, the resources we are basically extracting from, from uh, our environment uh, and that, that will basically be reduced. And so we'll be able to maintain geological structure. And while talking about regeneration also, uh, which is basically, I mean, very related to what to some climate actions in trying to bring uh, back nature so uh i mean something the nature that have already been lost we try to regenerate so it's very much related to some climate actions also so we also then deliberated on on uh, on on the linkages between the circular economy and, and climate change or climate action and we felt that uh, there is a gap that or that needs to be filled there in that um, we have not in a way linked both together very well and we have not made it, make it stronger. And we, we said that, I mean, generally in the world, there is always, there is a momentum around climate change, which I, we feel that the circular economy can leverage. But then so far, uh, the linkage between the two is not so strong. And the question around that, that then came in response to that is that how do we strengthen that linkage? Uh, how to be strengthen that, that it's been challenging even to get momentum or to, to mainstream the circular economy to the COP27 discussion. And, uh, and so we were saying that that is a tricky thing to do. And so we are losing some opportunity as far as the circular economy is concerned, even with the COP27 that is coming up in terms of linking both together. And if we lose this opportunity, it means that we'll continue. And then we say, okay, it's COP28 that we want to strengthen this linkage and see how we can. So 
practically speaking, how do we intensify the momentum around the circular economy and um, integrate it very well into climate action, into climate change discussion? I think there is a gap there and there is an opportunity there that we need to see how we can do this. That's what we discussed uh, in the group. Thank you very much, Daniel, for sharing those reflections. Definitely, we need to um, be seizing the opportunity to ensure that um, the, the very many insights that are coming out from the work we're doing in circular economy is featured, especially because a lot of it does have an impact on um, climate action and helping to meet the various targets that have been set by different um, nations across uh, across the globe, not just in Africa. Um, could we get insights from room two? Sorry, Jokuru, there was just a message from Piotr. He's asking if he yes. needs to leave, if he could jump in at group six quickly. Oh, definitely. Please do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so from group six, we decided to focus this short discussion on, on additional insight that uh, is quite along with our French colleague that from group one. It's about democratization of decision making on policies to boost circular economy. We often see that uh, affluent uh, actors, including governments, the most influential government, but also big companies, might take an uh, unproportionate big role in deciding and therefore um, grabbing the values, the most valuable streams, for example, and leaving only very bad uh, residual waste for the rest, uh, very often um, waste picker, the informal waste sector. And, Really, um, I think that some very often uh, when I see it uh, in the, the circular economy discussions, we see that this aspect is neglected, the equity democratization um, of um, developing circular economy to ensure that no one is left behind. Um, and especially it's very important for emerging economies where informal sector is the one that until now uh, holds all the skills and actually does the job, uh, even if governments don't do this. And we will see that in big industries will come into the play and they are already coming. But if they will come in, in an intrusive way, grabbing all the values and leaving behind you know, um, all the people who were so far doing this job, that is not good. And especially it's relevant for setting EPR schemes, extended producer responsibility, where this labor force, um, waste pickers are not included. Uh, it can it can be really very detrimental for for them if they are not included. So there are a few organizations working on that, like Gaia or Diego, uh, who developed their uh, quite good positions or guidelines on setting inclusive EPR schemes. And it's uh, so it's not what, what I mean is what we discussed is that formalization of informal way speakers can can be can be happening should be happening taking fully their skills and um, demands on board and allowing them to be part of it, uh, of better separate collection rather than just commingled collection by big trucks that might be, big trucks might be more efficient uh, time-wise and maybe cost-wise for, for a separate coll for collection. But in the long term, they are losing also all the value that could be kept if separate collection would be in place. And to make separate collection, it might cost more because of labor, but labor is abundant in, in those countries. Uh, and separate collection will keep the value of materials longer, will easier, will um, reduce the cost of, of later stages of recycling and sorting and putting into new materials. So we have to look at the cost in the whole value chain, whole, uh, you know, um, re receipt of bill, the whole bill, rather th than just saying that a coming good collection by big trucks is just uh, cheaper and faster. Let's not focus on separate collection, which I see unfortunately sometimes happening in developing countries. So that was our discussion. Thank you so much. Very interesting discussion, but I will have to leave soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also thank you for joining um, the session today. It was definitely, um, we're definitely happy to have heard the various insights you've, share, you've shared. And then actually making those connections with what you've pointed out and something that came out in the French, um, in the French group was again, the importance of being strategic about how we again implement circular economy. We shouldn't just necessarily take it as 
at face value that circular economy has these um, wider co-benefits for society, but actually properly understanding these because they are definitely processes that you need to think of. If you're going to take on a specific action, what can be done? Um, what can be done to ensure that the impact you're creating um, leads to a positive outcome as opposed to um, negative externalities. And again, the important role that is played by different sectors in the um, in the pri in well the private sphere. So we have our informal waste pickers, we have different vulnerable group, vulnerable groups, we have our youth. All of these also play key roles and how to ensure that we leverage the potential and opportunity that comes from um, various players who can contribute to decision making in a positive manner. Anna. Could we then um, go over to room two and hear the insights from there? Well, uh, hi again. Uh, we didn't have the time to agree who was going to deliver uh, the, the, our discussion points, but I see that there is no, not many left from my group now. So I'll, I'll just go through very quickly. Uh, so we also talked about um, the the co-benefits or the kind of the measurement and the need of the holistic measurement of of the benefits uh, or negative impact in order to kind of first of all prioritize, but also to, to determine if uh, if the uh, if the uh, final impact is indeed positive and to pay attention to that. Uh, and then um, maybe another point uh, that. Uh, we made is that um, we underlined the, the nature of circular economy still to bringing in solutions and how to how to share more business opportunities. Uh, we had a uh, we had a uh, participant from South Africa who is indeed um, exactly in this kind of sector of of sharing business opportunities, creating spaces for circular circular uh, initiatives and uh, and people to tap on them. So, so uh, how could we um, feature circular economy also as a, as a kind of solution oriented strategy uh, for these uh, challenges? That would be maybe the two points that were discussed. Thanks. Thank you so much, Elisa. I think you ended off with a good um, point there at the end. We need to start thinking about um, solutions-oriented um, outcomes that we can that we can achieve through the circular economy. Um, can we then go into our last uh, our last room, which is room three, for your insights? I think that was our room. Um, so yeah, I think just just to reflect back. Um, and, and again, always thanks to uh, Edouard, our uh, uh, representative. Um, he's always had some useful stuff in there. But what he said reflected very much what we're talking about, and particularly in the French-speaking uh, countries, is a lack of capacity, knowledge, and understanding in terms of what circular economy can bring. Um, so when we talk about the COP27 opportunities being mooted as sort of an action-oriented outcomes, how do we drive that? Um, looking at specific project applications and, and, and practical applications on the ground, as opposed to some of the stuff we've been doing through ASIN and ASIN Foundation is driving into looking at different countries. And we find that, that after a year, two years, sometimes three years in a country, we still haven't got to any practical application because we're still trying to go through the policy and the talk and the discussion side of things. So maybe what we need is we need a basket of best practice sort of demonstration type projects in each of the different sectors, whether it's agriculture or infrastructure or energy or whatever it might be. Um, and look at each different country and try and find out where the sweet spot is, where we could look at project implementation. Um, because the needs are there. The needs in Africa are, um, you know, we, it's not about the policy and, and, and the requirements. It, it's like we need jobs, we need energy, we need water, we need food, we need housing. Um, and maybe to focus in on those outcomes first um, and look at it from a project-based approach um, where we know there's a whole bunch of work that's been done through the likes of, of uh, our partners in Footprints Africa and, and others showing what, what does work um, and to bring those applications into Africa. But again, it comes back to what I said right at the beginning. How do we align climate finance with circular economy? How do we look at bringing 
project developments into Africa that, that let's put it on the ground. Let, let's have impact. Let's have the, the benefit and the outcome for the people on the ground. Then measure it afterwards and talk about how, how great a job we did. Um, rather than trying to convince them up front uh, what it can do, let's get to practicalities. Um, so practical outcomes-based opportunities is definitely the focus we'd be looking at. Thank you very much, Chris, for sharing the insights um, from room three. Definitely well tied into all the um, ideas that have been emerging from today's discussions and um, ensuring we make that shift into application and doing work on the ground. And um, from there remains the questions that both Elisa and uh, Magash were alluding to in their um, presentations on the importance of getting circular economy into the agenda at a global level and ensuring that what then emerges there reflects these ideas that are coming out from the ground, which is we need practical action on the ground. Before before um, people accept, say, circular economy um, ideas and um, initiatives, they want to see actual um, positive impact into their everyday livelihoods and um, how they, for example, get to work, how they access food, how they um, move around and enjoy their, in their natural environment. And so how do we use circular economy as an enabler for that? Um, we are approaching the end of our program for today, and so one thing I would like to then end off with is perhaps to get um, any final comments that the team would like to share from um, from uh, from the floor, and perhaps to also get final uh, reflections from our panelists, from Elisa, from Agash, as well as yourself, Chris. If there's anything you would like to add that may have not been covered in today's discussion. Um, while we give the audience a moment to perhaps identify final reflections you would like to share, we could start off with our panelists, um, Elisa and Magash, if there's anything you would like to add, final reflections on today's um, discussions. I'm happy for you to go in any order. Thanks, Chikud. I'm just trying to get my camera to switch on. There we go. Um, so I, I think a lot of what we discussed here can be classified as challenges and barriers, but a lot of possibilities and opportunities. I think the point here is to not lift our foot off the accelerator um, and to keep on pushing at it because there's a lot of uh, brain power on this call and people that are dedicated to the cause. And I think if we all continue pushing in this right direction, we can make a big, big dent towards these objectives we are chasing. So while the, um, the hurdles might be huge, I think our ability to adapt and think around is, is even greater. So we must not lose hope. Thank you. Thank you, Magash. Over you, to you, Anisa. Hello. So yeah, uh, actually, um, I was just about to uh, write in my notebooks uh, thoughts for the COP27 side session. So indeed, it's been in a practical way, very, very useful and very inspiring for me to be here today and uh, hear the discussions, read the chat. Uh, it helps uh, really a lot now that we start uh, the last push of, of designing the, the side event for COP27. Uh, indeed, how to underline uh, what is the concept of a circular economy? What does it really mean, mean for Africa? Uh, sharing practical examples. I liked how Chris put it at the end that let's implement projects um, and then measure their impact and, and kind of rather go and show than, than tell or try to convince up front. Um, and how does this exactly, like how does circular economy, how does it actually uh, kind of manifest itself in the, in the real life, like jobs, housing, water, and food, uh, these kind of topics. So it's been really, really, uh, really uh, inspiring for me. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, hope to join the roundtables also, also later. I hear that this is happening regularly, so don't hesitate to to invite me as a listener next time. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody.
Definitely. Thank you to Elisa. Um, perhaps, Chris, without putting you on the spot as well, to maybe get any final reflections that you might have for our discussion today. I think you always put me on the spot. Um, yeah, I, th I think that the the opportunity really is to is to embrace a lot of what's coming out here. We've, we've got a lot of um, very Africa centric viewpoints, and, and I think those are critically important. Uh, as Elisa said, um, those are some of the things she can take forward towards uh, COP27, which is great. Um, so she's probably got as much out of this as she put in, which is really what these uh, events are all about. Um, but also um, from the Gush perspective and, and looking at ICLI, um on the on the global stage in terms of what they're doing, I think it's great um, that we are looking at the practical realities of, of what's uh, what's required in Africa, and, and we need to take those lessons through to COP27. So we are hoping um, that yeah there are other events leading up to that. Um, we'll try and share those through our different social channels. Um, but the idea is again, let's make this a practical application. How do we look at an outcomes-based um, COP27 that is going to benefit Africa? We're hosting it for the first time, so we really want to see something come out for Africa. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's going to lead up obviously to World Circle Economy Forum that we will have in December uh, in Rwanda. And I think that there's a number of other different side events and opportunities to to link into there. But um, Practicality, uh, capacity, implementation, um, and impacts and outcomes. I think those are the key issues we can probably take from this. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Um, I haven't seen any additional hands for final reflections. So perhaps just to say thank you, everyone, for um, your contributions to today's discussion. What Chris has um, highlighted right now is just a good summation of today's discussion. And um, we're looking forward to seeing what emerges out of COP27. In the chat, we have seen linkages to um, a number of well, a couple of sessions that are emerging, the one that is being held by the AFDB, which Elisa has put in the chat, as well as another which Caroline um, Kawira has also shared, which is coming up next week. So please do click on those links to get a sense of what's emerging around, um, around this space. And then finally, um, before we close off, I would just like to note that um, over the course of all the sessions that we've hosted, we've been sharing a link to um, a paper series on circular economy in Africa, examples and opportunities, which we have been looking for various inputs and feedback on from different people in different sectors. So please do also click those um, links to access the articles, um, as well as the link to review the papers. We definitely want to hear from you about um, the insights that are coming from the papers and your reflections. So thank you everyone for today's session, and we're looking forward to seeing you in our next session. We will be sharing a digest of today's session as well as information about um, the upcoming session for November. Bye everyone and have a good rest of your day.